Welcome to CCM, and I appreciate you coming in. This is a word for you. God wants you to draw close to God. As you draw close to him, remember what he said in James. He will draw close to you. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You are covered in light. You are covered in Christ. That's the armor of God. Remember, you don't put the armor on. You go before God, and he clothes you. And when he puts it on, you know it's not crooked. You know it's not messed up. And for those of you that don't understand, the armor, especially the shield of faith, goes all the way around you, underneath your feet, and the foundation that you stand upon is Jesus himself. Amen. This foundation is a rock. As long as you walk in him and move in him, that foundation will stay under your feet no matter where you are in this planet. Remember, he that heareth my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's unto a wise man. Be wise. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to CCM, and we just appreciate you. What you see here is an illustration of what we call the natural man. Everyone say natural man. And did you know the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit? That's why God wants us to get born again and become spiritual. Our Father is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what you see is an illustration, I call it a type or shadow of the carnal man. It's gaudy, it's loud, it's boisterous, it's, it's got pride. And the Bible says that when we come to God, we are to take our natural man or our body and take it off and lay it before the Lord. This is called being crucified with Christ on a daily basis. I do this because there's one thing the enemy needs is he needs for my flesh to be active and in charge. Therefore, I lay my flesh at the feet of Jesus. Amen. But now you see another thing. This represents the carnal mind, the mind that doesn't think about the Lord, the mind that always wants to run the show. And so what we need to do with our mind and renew it by the Spirit of God, and we need to take off the old man and his thinking and put on the new man, ta-da, <laughs> and take this old man and constantly get in the word of God so that we are washed by the water of the word and clean in our thoughts and motives. Amen. Good morning to you. Let's get in the word together. series called Reigning in Life in Christ. And today we're going to be talking about the power of prayer. Everyone say, there's power in prayer. How did you change your life? You asked Jesus to come into your heart. That's prayer. Can you say amen? And in that prayer, God honored it. So the Bible says, your prayers and the promises that God has given us are in him, yes, and in him, amen. So guess what? I had a brother tell me, he says, you know, I pray and sometimes God says no. I said, well, you don't pray in the flesh. You don't approach God in the flesh. And every time you do, he's going to say no. Because the flesh wants to be its own God. 
Let's dismiss our families and our church. Amen. They're going out to learn about God. And we bless you as you go in Jesus' name. All right. So I'm going to read my paragraph to you, and then we're going to read the scripture we have for you. So blessings to you, church family, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are learning to do the things God has asked us to do and walk in his way as God has laid them out before us. Say amen. The word of God gives us a pattern of how to pray and a pattern how to walk with the Lord. Jesus' disciples realized that the secret to Jesus and his ability to do all that he was doing, because he was human, was his prayer life to the Father. Jesus always prayed. He always prayed first thing. See, we don't really see the account of that because the accounts that we have of Christ are only the miracles, the wonders, and things were important. He did much more than that. Can you say amen? And John says all the books that were written of him, you know, there couldn't be enough of them, of all the things that Jesus did and is doing. Say amen, somebody. All right, so you and I, prayer is one of the greatest tools. And the reason why I say that is because you got saved through prayer. God gave you that tool of prayer so that you may require of him, that you may invite God in. Hello? Now, if you know the history of the Old Testament, remember Adam lost his planet. He gave it over to our enemy. But Jesus, the last Adam, he's called the last Adam, came and redeemed it back. So the planet belongs to the Lord. But the world system is very corrupt. So therefore, we don't live in the natural by the world system anymore. We are not of this world. Can you say amen? We might be in it, but we're not of it. Amen. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, Jesus said. But fear not, little flock. I have overcome the world. And if we be in Christ and we're in Christ, then we overcome too. Say amen. I'm going to try to get my balance there. My foot got caught on the rug. All right. Here's a note. This love of God is demonstrated best when we pray for others. Say amen. It will move God on behalf of others. God needs an invitation. God did not come into your life automatically. You had to invite him in. He is not changed. He runs the same principles, the same kingdom. We have to do it his way, and that's Jesus. Do it the way Jesus said, and Jesus said, come unto me. All you are heavy laden and burdened, because you've been living in the world, and I will give you rest. Okay, after the rest, he says, then take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He said, learn not about me, but learn from me. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to have you, teach you things that are deep of God so that you know personally those things. And I am meek and I'm lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. Now, there's one thing to rest and sleep, but there's another thing to have rest in our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. Can you say amen? Because the world's so messed up. So we don't live in the world to take our energy from the world. We live in Christ in the world to bring Christ to the world. Can you say amen? We're going to cover these four areas, and then we're going to read our paragraph. Number one, we're going to cover all prayer is in Jesus' name based on a new covenant. All your prayer is based in Jesus' name in a new covenant. You don't pray in Christ's behalf. Oh, Lord, I pray in your name. Where do we learn stuff like that? Now, there's nothing really wrong with it. It just seems to not say the name of Jesus. You know, when people pray on the TV or something like that, and, and they really, you know, be trying to be as an actor, you know, a Christian and stuff, and some of them are sincere. I listen if they're going to use Jesus' name or not. Because the use of Jesus' name shows that you know the covenant. You know the covenant. Say, everyone, say covenant. covenant. A, a contract where blood flows. Say that. Covenant, contract where blood flows. Who shed his blood for the new covenant? There you go. All right, so all things in Jesus' name according to the new covenant. Why? We'll, we'll find out. Two, meeting with God in the secret place. Why? Why there? And some of you know, some of you don't. And thirdly, spiritual growth only happens when you're face-to-face -face with God. 
You know, we walk around in the earth and we follow God, we love God, but that's not where you grow. That's where your character's developed, where your faithfulness is developed. But we grow spiritually by the one that can only grow us up spiritually is in his presence. So if you don't have much of a prayer life and you don't spend time with God, your growth is going to be little bit at a time. I'm sorry to say that. I don't mean to be mean. But many Christians I've known 40, 50 years with the Lord, and they still cuss, they still drink, they still party, because they have not gotten very far with God. Oh, why should I? I mean, he loves me. I'm going to heaven anyway. Yeah, but you won't get a, a, an ounce of rewards, because God rewards us by our faithfulness and love towards him. Say amen. All right, and then thirdly, spiritual growth only happens face to face. And fourthly, we're transformed. Don't forget that you are constantly being transformed, even this day. You have not arrived. We keep going to God, and he keeps making us better. He keeps transforming us from the inside out. And let's not be like Peter and John and James when they went up with Jesus in the mountain. And they saw God standing there, Jesus and the glory of God, and Elijah showed up, and, and Moses showed up, and all of a sudden, Peter stands up and says, I think we should build a church. Huh, one for these, and let's go ahead and do a work for God. No, let's not be religious. Let's get deeper with God and find out what our assignment is and carry it out. Did you know the healthiest place in the world is doing the will of God? That's where you can't get sick, where you can't do anything because you are doing the Father's will and you are enclosed in him. I mean, if you are enclosed in God, which the Bible says, I can show you hundreds of scriptures that say you are, how can we miss it so, for so many years? How can we miss this protection and care that Jesus went through hell and back to give us? I tell you why, because it's not being preached. It's not being taught as much as it should be. Say amen. You guys, I want you to teach it. I want you to share it. I want you to give it away. Why? Because in giving away this kind of teaching, you're going to make somebody's life whole and stable again if they obey it. And man, that's what I want. I want to come before God and have God say to me, son, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And you say, well, how could you say that about you? He will say it to anyone that obeys him. He loves you so dearly. Are you ready? Let's get in. Let's read our paragraph. Now, I tell you what, Danny was working really hard all yesterday. Linda, I know she's been burning the candle at both ends, and so keep, keep my wife in prayer. Bless her heart. Okay, Acts chapter 4, 29 through 31. Now the Lord... Look on their threats. What was happening is the church was growing. It was developing. And they were being persecuted. Satan was looking for every way to shut it down. Hey, don't forget, he wants to shut us down. You know, each individual. Now the Lord, look on their threats. See, they're praying. And grant to your servants that which is all boldness. They may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal. And the signs and the wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was what? That's what I want you to learn to do. We're going to teach you more about that. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, don't think that they weren't filled on Pentecost. This is chapter 4. They got refilled. Re-emboldened, re-come and get refilled and emboldened. Here's important. This is a short. When we come to church, come to sit at Jesus' feet. Come to worship God and him alone. Fellowship will be good afterwards. But come to meet with him. Come to be with him. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then learn, as two or three are gathered, Jesus is here, manifested to heal, to help. All we have to do is open up to him and not be so easily distracted. Then what we do is we say this, Father, I come under your authority so that your presence and your spirit has full operation to minister to me, minister to your people. So we come under your authority so the name of Jesus Christ can be spread unhindered. 
Amen. So let's look at first point. All prayer in Jesus' name based on the new covenant. Now I'm going to take just a minute out to explain. The term covenant in its Hebrew means to have a contract that's so important that you actually cut your flesh. Now in God's case, he can't bleed. That's why Jesus had to have a body. But in the beginning with Adam, remember he used an animal and the blood of an animal to cover Adam's sin and so he could approach Adam without killing him. Because God's presence to sin will wipe it out. That's why you, Christians need to know when you're filled with God every day, Satan moves out of your way. It's when you get tired and distracted and everything, the light gets a little dim, he sort of sneaks up. We don't want that. Can you say amen? So we come, to, come under God's authority. We meet with God so he keeps us fresh. Fresh children. Smell good. Feel good. We're in faith because why? God lives in us. Amen. So our prayer is based on the new covenant. So quick, quick, quick question. A new covenant means that it's a, a contract between two parties. In this case, God and us. Now, who came and who died for us? Who came and who shed his blood for us? Jesus did. As Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, he represented us. You see, we're not perfect, but he was. And as God, he represents the Father. So when he shed his blood, just so you may know, he set a covenant in order that cannot be broken. It's set in the heavens, eternal in the glory. So guess what? You, you didn't save yourself. And you can't lose your salvation unless you give it up. So somebody who's having a hard time, maybe just rebelled against God, God never left you. You just shoved him aside. Stop shoving him aside. Let him run your life. Boy, he does a better job. Say amen. And so that covenant is so important that we base Father in Jesus' name brings that covenant right before God. When you say, Father, in Jesus' name, you're moving all heaven and earth, and the covenant is right before God. God says, okay. Now, a covenant means that whatever party takes care of the other party. There's usually an exchange of a gift or a tree, exchange of life. So, God exchanged his life for man, and man, we give up our life for God. Covenant. In that covenant, if we come to respect and come to fruition on understanding it, we become the most powerful new creation in the earth. That's what Satan doesn't want us to know. He doesn't want you to know how powerful you are in God. He wants you to think you have to do it naturally. You have to think of things and do things and this and this and this. That's just a lie. It's called religion. Religion is man's effort to get closer to God. While God is grace, is God in you doing that very work? Say amen. That was a good one there. All right, so let's go to Luke chapter 11, look at 1 and 2. Our prayer is based on the new covenant. All right, in Jesus' name. Now it came to pass, as he was praying a cert in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples. Now, Jesus said at one time, he says, as long as I'm with you, you don't need to pray. You can just talk with me. Hello? Remember, they were Jewish. So they prayed to a God that they hoped would help them. Many of them weren't faithful Jews. They just were fishermen Jewish, you see. Hello? Jesus was able to reach Peter, James, John, all of these, because they weren't consecrated as being Jews. They were consecrated as, I'm, I'm Scottish, I'm Jewish, kind of idea, so God could reach them. Hello? You see, if we're steeped in a belief system that doesn't allow room for God, we're in trouble. And this is important for us to know. Jesus picked the little things, the not important things, the fishermen that could cuss, cuss the fly paper off the wall. This he used. These people he loved, he cared for. He was friend of publican and sinners. Why? Because he didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. Can you say amen? Of such we are and were. 
Teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. In verse 2, so he said to them, when you pray, say. I'm going to throw this in. Here's a little short for you. How many know when you pray, you pray to the Father in Jesus' name? Say amen. amen. That punches you right in heaven. When you pray, God then, the Spirit of God, puts you in Christ when you approach God and then lifts you up in the Spirit before the throne of God. So when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you take the holy elevator right up before the throne of God and you're sitting before the throne of Almighty God and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. They're all ears. For the Lord's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. Can you say amen? And we're only right because we have Jesus in it. So as a Christian, you need to know, Father, in Jesus' name, you're whisked up in the spirit. You're covered here in the physical realm, and Satan cannot hear your prayers. Hello? You're in the dome of silence before the throne. Let me ask you, do you think the devil can get up before the throne of God? No, he's thrown out of there. Do you think the devil can listen into your prayers? No, not in Jesus' name. See, that's what the enemy's hiding. He wants you to think he's got your back door key and he, he's in every conversation. He's sneaking around like he's everywhere. No, all the devil has, and I hope you get this one, all the devil has is a massive computer. You understand what a computer is now. You see, it's not magic. It's not a spiritual force that he uses. He has spiritual computer of some form that he has your program. Everybody is born in the earth that's human, not an animal or anything. He has the computer program on. He stole it from God. But when you and I turn our life over to God, all he has is the old program on us. I said all he has is the old program. That's why when he runs temptations and, and algorithms to you, he uses your old life. You're all... And he runs it on you like a computer thing. Oh, who do we got? Scott. Oh, God told him to do this, do this. Well, is he doing it? No. Run this scenario on him, see if he bites. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away. Drawn away from where? From God into their self. Immediately, the door's open for the tempter to come. Because he can smell the meat. I'm being funny with you. He can smell the flesh, the carnal meat. So don't, if you're going to carnal it out for a second, quickly get out of that. Because the meat comer is come, the fly. See, all of those illustrations and things are to teach us a lesson to stay with God. He's going to get us out of here. Say amen, somebody. Go down with me to John 16. I want to show you this covenant. Verse 23 and 24, you know the scripture, but it's a good one. And in that day, the day that Jesus goes home to be with the Lord, the day that the New Testament's instilled, you will ask me nothing. You won't converse with me like we're, we're together. Four things. We'll talk, yes. We'll walk. We'll do all of those things. But most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name. Hello? In my name, he will what? Yeah, I want you to say, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will? That's right. That your joy be made full. And I just got through telling him, look, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. He's going to reveal the Father, reveal everything to you. You need to buddy up with the Holy Spirit and get close to him and not grieve him in pride. Because then he will open your eyes, show you your future, and begin to put your lives together. God wants us to say, you've got a new business coming. And he's saying this to someone. Got a new business coming, and I'm going to help put it together. And it's going to be a beautiful business out of your home. And God says, take care of it and bathe it in the prayer. Amen. All right. You know, when God gives you something to do, it's blessed. All we have to do is be after our Father's business. Can you say amen? So in that day, you shall ask me nothing, but whatever you ask the Father in what? And what happens? We get whisked up before the Father. So remember, everybody uses, and I, I'm amazed. 
30 sermons about Daniel's prayer, of how he, he prayed seven times a day. Bless his heart, and he did good. But see, in the Old Testament, there's no going up before the throne of God. Hello? Now, Daniel was very close because of his fastings, because God chose him. But he still, when he prayed, it took a while for God to get the answer back into the earth because of the opposition. Well, Jesus took care of that. It's not there anymore. So when you say, Father in Jesus' name, boom, you're right in. There isn't, uh, 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 who's calling? Oh, it's Scott. Should we take the call or not? That says calling God, you see? And so the enemies have Christians think that there's some kind of, I don't know what, and they, they approach God that way. They don't act like they're a child of God, some reason, and they've made mistakes. And so they're dwelling all that and making, it's keeping them sick, and, and their priorities are off. And listen, listen, don't take what you, listen, don't take what you experience above the Word of God. Hello? You see, you were lost and you were a sinner, but you took the word of God and you changed that. Don't let your experiences be your gospel you preach. Oh, yeah, I asked God for healing, but he hasn't found, found me to be healed. You do that, God forbid. Hello, and we do do that. For example, you pray, give somebody to God. Don't. Open a conversation and say, you know, I'm so worried about so-and-so. Didn't you just pray for them? Yeah. So what are you worried for? You're not paying attention to what you're saying. Check. Get it under the blood, please. You're actually tripping your own self up. We are hung by our own tongue. Proverbs 6, 2. Everyone say, Whew. all right, lighten up, Pastor Kerry. All right. Here's a couple points I want you to get. All right, number one, church, we are now living in the New Testament with New Testament promises and principles. We've got to learn how they're done. We've got to learn it to do it Jesus' way. Say amen. amen. Two, prayer is a sincere, heartfelt approach to God in Jesus' name. That's what prayer is. Don't come to God with your head. Don't utter many words. You're not going to impress them with your intelligence. Come with a sincere, humble heart. And you'll have God's ear forever. Say amen. Thirdly, when we pray, it doesn't say if we pray. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are filled and lifted up before the Spirit of God into the heavenly throne room of God. I call it God's dressing room. Who does he address? He addresses us and then he dresses us. Can you say amen? It should be a daily thing. Father, I come to you. Good morning. Your hair's all matted, you know. I, I head for the coffee and turn it on. I go to my place where I meet with God. And then I, then I come and I say, Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me and cleanse me from anything that would hinder my prayers with you. This morning, I lift up Jesus. I lift you up. I hallow your name. I worship you. And Lord God, now I come. You see, and in that time when I'm praying that, I'm seeing God lift me into his presence. I'm sensing the anointing. We should pray that way. We should expect that to be because that's actually the reality of what happens to you. Now, you say, well, well I've never felt that. Well, that's because you're going on feelings. You're going on your previous idea. Now you understand that that. And so let's, let's try something together, shall we? Those of you in camera, everyone say, Father, in Jesus' name. I come under your authority, and I open up to you. Boom. Did you just feel that come right on you? Some of you can sense God, and if you can't, then you're not doing that often enough. You should be able to whisper the name of Jesus and sense his presence, because it's all around you. It's in you. And if you can't, God wants you to be exercised more in your sensitivity with God. Say, oh, me. It's my fault. No, we won't say that. <laughs> okay, shall we go on to our next point? Are you getting anything out of this? 
Here, I want to read Hebrews chapter 4, if you'll go there with me, and then we'll go to our next point. Hebrews 4, verse 14 and 16. This is why what we say is very important. This is why that by our words we're justified, saved, and by our words we can be condemned. That's why we don't talk about God's children, even though they might deserve it. <laughs> There's a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you this. They're picking on Joel Olstein. I want to tell you, Joel is a man of God. I know his father, John Olstein, very well. Sat, sat under his teachings. And see, Joel, you know, he might not be perfect, but he's a child of God. And how dare some little sniveling little brat that's probably jealous commenting on another child of God. Please, please, grow up. Grow up. It's hindering your walk. No wonder you don't get much blessings because you become a critic and a judge instead of a, a blesser. We're made to bless. You know, when I say, Peggy, I bless you, even if Peggy was doing something wrong, my blessing to her will straighten her out. You don't have to say, God, Peggy's doing some weird things. Straighten her out. Please don't tell God what to do. Just say, Father, I don't understand what she's going through. Well, Lord, bless her today. Go in and minister your needs. Take care of those areas she doesn't know to pray about and minister to her heart. Give her something to focus on about you. That's the way you should be praying for every child of God. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Because there's a revival coming and we're hindering the church of Jesus Christ is hindering that revival because we're commenting negative about everything. Shut that mess up. Carnal mindedness is death. Spiritually minded is peace. I used to say, I don't know if Scott remembers, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You know, that's a bunch of bunk. We need to be far heavenly minded in order to have the wisdom and the power of God to know how to operate and flow in our lives. Say amen. Point two, meeting with God in the secret place. You know the story? Luke chapter 18, verse 1, listen to what Jesus said. Then he spoke a parable, and he said to them that man ought always to pray and not to give up. Pray, pray, pray. And again, I say pray. Pray, pray, pray. But don't look at prayer as a, a labor. Look at it as a privilege. You're meeting with God. My next scripture to you is Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. You know this one. But there's some key principles God wants us to know. But you, when you pray, it didn't say if, did it? And if you're smart, it'll be a daily first thing every day. It doesn't take long. You present yourself just like the angels do before God. They come in and say, Lord, this Carrie. Oh, yeah, I know. And he pulls up your program. <laughs> no. He knows who you are. But when you go before him, sincerity and humility. He loves it. Just remember something. Every time you pray to God and spend more than a minute or two in his presence... Something changed in you. Hello? I'm going to say it again. When we take the time to pray sincerely to God and just be in his presence, we always leave that presence with something changed in us, eternally changed, not just fixed for that moment. He's growing us up. We're metamorphosizing from the inside out. So in order for us to change, we got to go to the changer. And he's got to exchange the old with the new. And he has to grow us up into Christ, who's the head of all principality and power. In order for that to happen, is we've got to give plenty of exposure time to God so that he can grow us up from the inside out. Say amen. From the inside out. Amen. Also, when you walk with God from the inside out, you're walking away from Satan's ability to read what you're going to do. Then you have the words of Jesus. Everyone that's born of the Spirit is like the wind. The wind blows where it listeth, and you can hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes or it goes. So is every man or woman that's born of the Spirit. Amen. That's the way we need to be. M movable by the, the Lord's hands, walking from the inside out where Satan can't read us. Now, if he's going to look at you, if you're that big of a threat and he's going to watch you, what is he going to see? He's going to see the outer man. 
He's not going to know what's going to go on on the inside of your heart. That's why we're to live in the spirit. We're to walk in the spirit so that he doesn't have a clue. He only knows your past algorithms and your past patterns and habits. That's where it says it's common to man. He can't tempt you with something new. Because something new, we always approach it with caution. Even God, if it's new, some of the stuff you're hearing me preach is new for a lot of Christians. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I suggest to you, do what the Bible says. Study to show yourself approved. Find out for yourself and rightly divide the word of truth. Say amen. All right. So Matthew 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut the door. This is a personal face-to-face time with God. That means phone, unplug, everything. You've got your own spot. Nobody interferes. Even my wife will tell you, when I start praying, she gets up, comes. Sometimes we'll join in the prayer, and, and we do that. But then there are times God says, get up, go into your office, and pray. Make sure you shut the door. Cut out all the confusion out there. Say amen. Spend time with your God and Creator. Amen. Shut the door. And your father who sees or meets with you in the secret place, in his throne room, in the spirit. The spirit is a secret place. Satan can't go into the spirit. He can see spiritual things from afar, but he can't go into the spirit. He doesn't have any spiritual tricks. But the Bible says in the last days, he will use lying signs and wonders. Not real signs and wonders. Lying signs and wonders. Now, I put out a teaching here that I wrote. I hope you read those messages I sent out. And I taught a little bit about the veil, how the enemy has all of these things behind the veil. That's why we don't see demons running across the road and all this stuff that's there. They're in another kind of dimension, just augmented off and behind a curtain. That curtain is represented into the temple where it says the curtain was torn from top to bottom. That was a separational curtain from God to evil man, and the priest in between the two. Jesus is our high priest now. So there is a curtain still there. So if you've got some spirits, if you happen to run into spirits, no big deal. Bind them up and put them behind the curtain in Jesus' name and and keep and say, you will stay there. You cannot come out. The only way these spirits can come out of that curtain is when some human being does something stupid like tarot cards and witchcraft. They pop open the curtain, bring that spirit out, and then it latches on to them. And it'll follow their whole generation if they don't get wise up and become smart. The reason I'm teaching is you don't hear it very many other places. I want you to know that you have so much authority in your little finger, you can round up. When you see somebody, let's say that they're habitually doing something wrong, just call it what it is. That spirit that causes that person to do that, I bind you up, I cast you out, and I render you ineffective, and I put you behind the curtain, and you'll never come out again. In Jesus' name. Boom. Oh, pastor, do you really think you can do that? I know you can't, but I do it all the time. Start doing what the Bible says. How about you living in a house where there's a lot of people close to salvation? When you pray with them, BJ, you lead them in the sinner's prayer. Don't you leave a person. I want you to pray with me. Oh, well, BJ, just take it. Say, Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Oh, thank you so much for praying with me. See, how are they going to turn down a wonderful lady like you? Let's start being wise as serpents and gentle as stuff. This summer's coming. I can't wait till all these we're going to do for this community. We're finally getting into a place where we can do it. Rejoice with us. Say amen. A couple of points I want to give you. Church, we are to treasure our face-to-face time with God every day. Say amen. Two, this is where we develop spiritually, where we are exercised, adjust, anointed, and appointed for our day to conquer it. You don't meet first, guess what? You're going to have a little trouble. Three, notice it's a one-on-one meeting with God, not one in all the distractions of life. Sitting and soaking while he's adjusting and maturing us before him. You cannot be before God without some form of change. Say amen. And then fifthly, 
come and keep on coming to Jesus and surrender. Come unto me. That, the Greek says, come and keep on coming to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. We need to come, surrender, and lay our selfish, fleshly life like you see me do down at the feet of Jesus. When you do that, say, Lord, I come to you and I lay my flesh down. Boom. Now God's talking to your spirit and soul. You don't have to deal with your flesh. But you come to him and say, oh, Lord, you know what I went through this week. Now you're bringing his, your flesh to him. He says, I know exactly why you went through that this week. you walking around in your flesh. I've been trying to tell you not to do that. Come on, say, oh, me. Laugh at me. I'm telling you the truth. You're not going to get stuff like this everywhere. Pass it around. All right, can you say amen? So come, keep on coming, surrender, keep on surrendering, because God is rebuilding you from the inside out. Next point, third point, spiritual growth happens only face to face. Go with me to Psalms chapter 5, look at 1 through 3. This is King David. Remember, he committed adultery and murdered. Old Testament, he talks about the new piece of cloth on the old cloth, remember? That was David and many of the Old Testament saints. The anointing would come on them. They would do mighty things for God. And then they would get back into their flesh because God's not dwelling in their heart. And then do something stupid. Does it sound familiar? So we, we meet with God so that we don't slip into that condition. But in the Old Testament, David still had the the words about him from God. He's a man after my own. So listen, as long, I don't care how many mistakes you make, as long as you're after God's heart, he's going to pick you up, clean you off. He's going to fix you, help you. But let me tell you that you're only going to grow and become stabler in God's presence, not out there. You're to get filled and take that out there. You're not to get your gratifications out there to take before God. Hey, Lord, let me bring you my stinky, my stinky underwear. <laughs> so don't bring him your flesh. Come to him in the name of Jesus. And certainly don't live in your flesh because it's the same result. <clears throat> All right, say amen. Give ear to my words, O oh Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you will hear when? When? First thing, check in. Oh, God knows where I'm at. There you go thinking again, boo-boo. He does know where you're at. You're not with him. You're, to be absent from the body is what? Now, there's a twofold meaning in that. If you're all the time with you on your mind all the time, you're away from God's and his thoughts and his doing. But if you are away from your thoughts and your doing, you laid yourself down before God, you are present with the Lord. So it does it talk about death and go and be with the Lord, but it also talks about our occupation and our perception. When we're focused on ourselves, can you think about the Lord? No. Not really. And if you do, it's all about getting your needs met. Why, oh why, me, oh me. I blame everybody. I'm not going to church. There, there's sinners there. People make mistakes there. Well, you're not going to go to the hospital because you're sick? Well, you've got to be stupid. And that's exactly what Satan is doing. He's playing many people because they don't go to church because they think it's religion. No, it's a personal go to church and learn, 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 grow, grow, grow. Say amen. Yes, Lord. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry. My King, my God. For my voice you all hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer 
unto thee in Jesus' name and look up. See, that's Old Testament. Now we bring Jesus' name in there. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Because when Jesus uh, laid that out, it was Old Testament. Now, in that day, you'll ask the Father in my name. Or you'll pray in my name. You'll pray the Father in my name. Why? Because his kingdom is radiantly here. Did you know there's more power in angels in this room than people? Hello? Yeah. But how are you tapping into it? Ask God to help you to tap into things. Amen. Because we can only tap in if we know we can and if we know how to. Not only that, but we have an escort. His name of the Holy Spirit. His job is to show us how to. Say amen, somebody. A couple of points. Church, if we are diligent to daily meet with God, our transformation into a new creation will happen quickly. Two, the enemy knows this. That is why he keeps us so busy, spending so much time, doing a whole lot of things, and we can never get the time to spend to grow. Why? Stability. A Christian that's unstable, unstable excuse me, has no prayer life. Hello? Because they're vacillating between spirit flesh, spirit flesh. And a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. So we want to make sure that we get a good dose of God and we walk in the spirit daily. Say amen. And we grow exponentially. Third thing, prayer before God strips off our old man, neutralizes him. While building us up on the inside, reestablishing our strength and stability in Christ. And fourthly, let's take a look of what Jesus said to his disciples, his disciples concerning this. Go with me to Matthew. I'm going to open up a scripture to you. You probably have never heard it shared this way. Maybe you have. Now in Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he's telling them how a man strips his old man off and how the new man is built back up on the inside. Now, here's, let me set the stage. Jesus is telling his disciples, when you meet with me, spend time with me, the old man is stripping away while the new man is building built up. Say amen. And you'll never notice this, but now you will when you read this, every time you read this, okay? So let's read it together. I, that, just let me read it to you, sorry. And see in the multitudes, this is Jesus, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, the Hebrews said, he kept on telling them, Peter, 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 do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Okay, so he's, this is a repeating, a repetitive teaching of the stripping of the old man and the rebuilding of the new. And every time you go into prayer, say so every time, this is happening. More of the old man's being stripped, more of the new man's being built. You say, well, I'm already saying, I already have Jesus in my heart. Yeah, but he's not developed yet. Your old man is still in charge, whether you like to admit that or not. That's why you go to God and you crucify it on a daily basis. Get that old man off you. Just like you saw him take off this morning on my, my little illustration. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain. And he opened his mouth, and he kept teaching them, saying, Blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I've got to turn my page here. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteous or doing right's sake. For theirs, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men will revile and persecute you. Even say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. What you see there is a stripping away and a rebuilding. It's like ascending into the mountain of the Lord, which means the presence of going into the presence of God, and coming out of the presence of God for ministry. Ascending into God for stripping and rebuilding and going out into the world for ministry. Can you say amen? So let's break it down. First thing is, blessed are the poor in spirit. This literally is rendered out, blessed are those that come to the end of themselves and depend on on God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say, got it. You have to come to the end of yourself before you really can serve God. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Then the next one is blessed is he that what? Mourns. Everyone say mourning. mourning. See, we don't understand it because sometimes we're not Jewish, but mourning is that condition of being sorry. The moment you grieve God, you just say, Lord, Sorry about that. And then when people are hurting and you're worshiping God, like today, I cried. A few of you cried. That's mourning. It's a good thing. How is it good? Because God is softening your heart and working on your wine bag. Could you say amen? Blessed are those that mourn. Another word for mourn is fast. Go without for others. For they shall be what? Sow and reap. What's the next one? Blessed are the meek. It didn't say weak. Meek is that, like say for example, let's say I'm a real strong guy. But meekness is the ability to use just what's needed when it's needed. Like a horse. Horse doesn't need to do all its power and everything and displayed. Kind of like Christians I know. They're just big mouths, not very good walks. Whoops. Hello? We have a lot of power, but are we meeked with our words? Are we meek the way we walk? So that blessed are the meek, for they shall in what? Yeah. You see, God's not going to give the earth to irresponsibility. He's not going to give the earth to people who can't even handle their own life. So let's get with it and go with him and have him work on our lives so that we'll become good stewards over what he gives us. Blessed are the meek. Those are also mean, teachable. You see, a meek person, you can teach them and correct them. Any one of you can correct me if you do it with respect. I don't mind. And if you have a point, it's very important. You're very important to God. Pastors, most pastors I know are not like that at all. They're afraid to lose their spot. Listen, my spot's been gone a long time ago. I just served Jesus. Hello. You too. You see, you can't kill somebody who's dead to themselves. You can only insult somebody who thinks of themselves so much he would take offense. We'll talk about that sermon later on. Are you with me? Yeah. Then after blessed are the meek, what's the next one? Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. So if you notice, it's an advancement into the presence of God. Being able to be humble and meek and being uh, poor in spirit, and mourning, whenever you get hardened, you, you're able to cry and release. And then the third step, meek, and then the fourth step, now you're into the presence of God, and what are you doing? You're hungering for more of God, you're thirsting for more of God. Say amen. Then you get filled. Hunger and thirst, you shall be what? Filled. Then when we're filled, we leave the presence of God, and we go back into the world, don't we? What's the first one that follows that? Blessed are the merciful. Now listen, Christians. The church of Jesus Christ, you can see it. Go online. If I, let's say I follow BJ, excuse me, this will make a point. Let's say BJ is quite the little preacher and she's going around and preaching. But I film only her bad moments. And I spend a year 
following her around, sneaking up on her, and filming all her bad statements and moments. Would it be fair of me to say, this is who BJ really is? Do you see all those people picking on people and showing the clips of this and they said this and say that? Stay away from it. God says, if you don't stay away from it, you're going to curse yourself because he said, don't get near it. Hello, my job is not to preach at you. My job is to lift you up before God in prayer and give you the word you need to apply. Say amen. Other than that, I'm off the wall. <laughs> you don't need to be... So we come in, we get it stripped, we get filled. Now this all happens in a moment. You approach God just like that. And then as we leave, we learn to be merciful. What if somebody does something wrong? You don't stick your finger in their face. You don't criticize them. You don't tell others how nasty their ministry is. That's not merciful. Next one is, blessed are those that... Pure in heart. See, all of our motives have to be out of purity of heart. Otherwise, you're not going to get nothing. Every action that we do is measured by the pureness of our heart. So let's say you do something, but you hate doing it, but you're going to do it anyway. Might as well not. Let us take a shower so we don't smell you. Because the way you're doing it, the motive, the purity you're doing it in, God doesn't recognize anything that's not done out of a pure motive. Say amen. It's just the way it is. So let's make sure we do that way. From your inner man, your inner man. You see, God lives in your inner man. Let me ask you this question. So can your inner man sin? No. Your spirit where God lives and where God lives in your spirit cannot sin. That's why it says, he that's born of God sinneth not. Because he has the seed in him. Now, we can sin with our thinking and by our flesh. Come on. But from your heart, if you walk from your heart, your steps will be slower, more focused, and more accurately blessed. Huh? Huh? Blessed be the, one, the things that he does because he's a doer of the word. All right. Then it says... Blessed are the pure in heart. Then it goes on, verse 9. Blessed are the what? Yeah, our job is to bring and reconcile and make peace. Amen. Don't wear a badge and say, you know, I'm a peace officer. No, making peace instead of causing problems, we're to make what? Peace, not compromise. Peace. Say amen. You cannot cross the battery poles. So you can't compromise somebody's compromise. You simply say, look. It would be better for you to kind of get before God and straighten all that out because you're having a rough time. See the peacemaking on that? Instead of saying, I understand what you're going through. There's no peacemaking in that. Then what happens to us once we ascend in and we go out of our wonderful prayer closet and God every bit, every time we go into God, he's stripping us, he's helping us, he's building us, he's taking care of us so we can go in mercy, go as peacemakers, say Amen. And what do we do? We leave our prayer closet and quickly forget what kind of person we were. We get caught up in things and we start doing it out of the natural again. You're going to have to take a while for God to work that out of you. You see, they left, the Israelites left Egypt in a hurry, didn't they? Symbol like you and I. We asked Jesus in our heart and God translated us out of darkness into light. Happened in a hurry, didn't it? We left the world into the light. Amen. But it's going to take a little while to get the world out of you. That's where we get renewed. We go before God. So God is pulling the world out of us. In the worldly ways, doesn't make you a bad person. It just means they've been bad programmed. You got the bad program. Now replace it. Say amen. Your mind is a computer. Garbage in, garbage out. Last point. Oh, no, I need to say. So what do we got to look forward to, Peggy? It says when we're serving God, people are going to hate us. They're going to persecute us. They're going to say, oh, men are evil against us. Did you know what Luke says? He says, be careful. Jesus said in Luke, be careful when men think only and say only good things about you. 
Hello. In other words, you're not doing your job. I have people that don't like me. They haven't even met me. They've got a problem with you, too. Don't pay attention to that stuff. Oh, I got my feelings hurt. Well, what are they doing out there where they can get hurt? Come on. Here's another thing. I, I get real tired of this. Everything I'm going to do and say to you has purpose and meaning, especially in church. So if I have to ask or tell you to do it a different way, I'm after you becoming better. I'm not here picking on you. Why do we think when somebody says and offers something to do it better that we're being attacked? I tell you what, because of the devil. He makes your kids that way. Why are you lecturing me? I like to slap the little brat really good. Thank God I don't do that because blessed are the peacemaker. Come on, laugh with me. I had my children in such a place where they didn't get in trouble a lot. My son did, but my, my daughter didn't, Wendy. She probably remembers more. I only need to hold that belt up to my son, and he just shivered. You see, you apply discipline right, and they'll always remember when they do wrong. Moving right along to our final point. We're transformed into a new creation, and this is a lifelong process. Are you happy with where you're at right now with God? Don't say yes, because God doesn't want to leave you there. He's got more for you. Say amen. It's an adventure. Saddle up those horses. Amen. Go with me, 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll finish with you. 17 through 19. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. That's talking about in his spirit. And behold, all things have become new. All things of God. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled, brought us together to himself through Jesus Christ. And given us, Christians, the ministry of calling others to Jesus. The ministry of reconciliation. 19. That it is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or holding against them their trespasses and committed to us Christians the word of reconciliation. God so loved the world that he what? But verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the earth to condemn it. You see what's going on right now? There are Christians condemning everything. Let me show you something God showed me. Didn't Peter say in the last days, mockers and scoffers will come? Do you know what scoffing is? That's making fun of everything. Doesn't mean necessarily about God. So let's say Scott tells me he has this great idea, and I go, oh, Scott, you goofball. I'm mocking. It's not the mocking itself, but it is the doing of the mocking that gets us bound Criticism is the same way. We have a right to criticize what's not right, but the act of criticism too much will hurt us. God didn't call us to be a critic. He called us to be in prayer, you see. So it's the act of the doing. Jesus says, says he looks after a woman to lust in her heart, committed adultery. He's talking about the constant act of doing those things. People bound by pornography and stuff because they can't stop. That act is built in them. It's called a stronghold, and we need to be delivered of that. Say amen. But I'm not saying that these are your problems. This is how those problems begin. So he says, now all things are of God. He's reconciled us, given us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at, go with me to Romans 6, verse 6. Talks about our old man needs to be dead. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. We do this daily before him. That the body of sin, notice it's S-I-N, not S-I-N-S. Your body of sin has the nature of Satan in it. That's why he needs to be crucified every day because it will find something to do wrong. You don't believe me? Put a three-year-old in a room by themselves and then watch him in in the glass. 
It won't be long before they're into mischief. That's because we're in a fallen planet. So don't be stupid enough to keep yourself from God's hands and his care, thinking that you've got it together. You're that three-year-old in the room, and Satan's going to find something you're going to mess with. It's going to mess you up. So keep yourself with God. Say amen. The old man was crucified, so don't live him. Then finally, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. Put it off. Put it off. Push it aside is another set of words. The old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful us, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the attitude of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which is created according to God into righteousness and holiness. You only have two to serve. Every day you will wrestle with which one you're going to serve. You're going to be either in the natural or in the spiritual. Natural in the spirit. Now, my, my teachers told me no one can walk in the spirit all the time. Well, Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. So guess what, professors? God made it so we can walk in the Spirit. We can live in the Spirit. You just have to be taught how. Did you get something out of this this morning? Would you give the Lord praise? <laughs>